Zach Stevens from Sabotage, TSO, and Ark and Angel, and you are listening to the Phantasm Podcast. Crank it up. Phantasm. Maximum terror. Ah! That's your target audience, baby. Phantasm. And you know something? I sort of enjoyed it. Phantasm. Sell the metal. Sell the metal. Sell the metal. Sell the metal. Hey, this is uh, Dr. Vincent West. I've got one of my favorite vocalists today, Zach Stevens. Sabotage, Circle to Circle, Archangel, which is what we're going to be talking about today. I'm a huge fan of this guy, and Zach, thank you so much for taking the time to do this, man. I'm a huge fan. God, thank you so much, Vince. It's great seeing you again, man. Dude, this is awesome. Thank you for doing this. So, how did the Archangel thing come about for you? Well, a, week, uh, a producer that works for them, who happens to be the guitarist of the band... Aldo Lonobile. Okay. Okay. The Italian guy living in Naples, where the label's at. Right. I think he's close to there anyway. Um, he contacts, he's a big fan of sabotage and stuff growing up. He, you know, he, I think he's in his 30s, late 30s or something. Nice. So he said, hey, if I, they want, Frontiers wants me to produce some records with you and call it something, you know, whatever featured, sure. featuring Zach Stevens or whatever. And, you know, do some records together and stuff. And I I knew about this guy from this band, Secret Sphere, a progressive band yeah. that was in. Yeah, I know like who that is. They played at Prague Power. Yep. Yeah. USA in Atlanta, like well, one year. Where I saw years. you a long time ago. That's right. With Circle yeah. to Circle, yeah. I did it about four or five times with Barry. Yeah, mostly with Circle to Circle, I think. Yep. Yeah. But, um, so I'm like, yeah, all right. Uh, and I liked the guitar work. He's great. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it turns out that he produces many projects on Frontiers. Gotcha. You know, he's done the Jeff Tate uh, solo. Work. Oh, cool. He has produced uh, even Chris Caffrey's, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, band on Frontiers. Oh, cool. Spirits of Fire. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So, you know, I'm just one of them, you know, we, with the, with Ark and Angel. So I said, yeah, let's do a couple records and stuff. And so it's been real fun. You know, we have a concept of this Archon who was, you know, back in Gnosticism, which is a very complicated, you know, religion of the second century, like in the 1000s, which has, you know, it's Christian in the sense that Christ in, in that religion works for a guy who controls esoteric knowledge, <laughs> But he doesn't necessarily work for the guy who created the, the world right. and who runs the world. That guy uh, is is a different uh, a different guy. But Christ's role would be uh, it's the only way somebody can get redemption of the human spirit. Right. Right. So it's a very complicated uh, kind of thing. Um, so in that world. Which is, you know, we it's a fictional tale for us because, as far as we know, none of this really exists. If an archon did come down with wings, I'd be the first one to spit my coffee out and go, "Oh my God, what's going on?" <laughs> right. really think he's flying around. But uh, the archon is the mediary and the only way for the people of Earth to speak to those levels of gods, if you will. So he's the voice of the. He's the only way the voice of the people can get to let's say, Christ or the Demiurge, who is the boss of the entire thing, the creator of the whole thing, and then um, either the Gnostic, which would be the boss of Christ right. in that whole thing, and the boss of Christ is the one who, uh, again, can, controls all esoteric knowledge, so to speak. Gotcha. So, here we go with this Archon, and so we have this concept, except he's coming down in modern day time. Okay. Not from the year 1000s, where everything's from here, right. the ancient. 
heretical religion that, that Gnosticism is. Now we're bringing it to modern times. We're saying, hey, what if the Archon, if there is one out there and he let, and he's going to help us with all these problems we have? Right. You know, everybody on the edge of war, Cold War here, Cold War, you know what I'm saying? All sure. this stuff that seems to be hanging on the edge of a wire now. He can kind of help us through all that and give us some hope. So that's kind of where the concept is. And that's where the name came from. My wife, Catherine, actually writes all the lyrics for Archangel. Really? Yeah. So that works out well because of the chemistry there and stuff. And I really like how she does that. Um, she's really got a knack for it. And I, you know, I like writing lyrics. Like I wrote all of them for Circle to Circle and stuff like that. But it's not really my most. It takes me so much time. And with her, it just comes sure. so easily. And she loves the came up with the entire concept, the entire story. The depth of it, so I'm like, yeah, run with that, man, because that because as a singer, I get inspired by that when she hands me that stuff. Of course, of course. And I say, oh, okay. Each song is a story in the Archon's life, and we get these stories from everybody. If I meet somebody and they have an incredible story about their life, somebody who survived a you know a helicopter crash in Vietnam, who we talk, then it very well some of the stories could come from that. Ends up on like, right over-the-top experiences uh, that we just talk to people on a daily basis or something we read and stuff like that. You know, j- you know, just getting inspiration from all kind of areas and making that part of the Archon's life. Just kind of grabbing inspiration wherever we can. But she does a great job of that. So we've done it for two albums now. And uh, we've done some outside work too where she does that same thing where she'll write the lyrics and I sing because it, it, just, it just works for me now. Um, that kind of angle, you know, and it, it, it gives me a little bit more impetus to do different things. I want to continue growing myself. You know, the reason I do these out, you know, these outside projects, I'm just trying to continue learning, you know, get better at music. You know, if we sit around and we just rest on everything that we've done in our past career, I think you get a little stale. I just want to keep on going and keep learning and, you know, try to keep getting better. You know, I'm not getting any younger, so I might as well just try to get better. Sure. Um, so that's all I'm trying to do, hanging there with the voice, hanging in there with the learning and the, you know, the inspiration of the music. So that's basically where we're at. We got this. This is the album called Two. The first one was Fallen. Yep. Uh, so we're kind of getting a little better at the process. And I think this record's, you know, strong just because we're everybody's kind of getting used to the role. The, sing, the songwriters, everybody who's got a role, we're all getting a little bit more comfortable in that. So just briefly to jump into Circle to Circle, Burden of Truth, Masterpiece. Mm, thank you. Middle of Nowhere, Masterpiece, helped me through some really rough shit I was dealing with at the time in my life. I'd been robbed violently at a place I worked. And uh, oh. that Middle of Nowhere album, very special to me. Consequence Thanks of Power. Hear about that. That's no, funny. yeah, it's it's shitty. But, but seriously, I just wanted to tell you because I've never met you, I was, and I. Jeez, I was going through rough time. I mean, it, you know, like really personally, I was kind of going through some real up and downs at the time too. Is reading how that came out. That album not anything is. That, luckily, not anything that like you went through. God forbid. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad it could help. And then uh, delusions of grandeur. I mean, really, just a strong catalog, man. I mean, uh, those records specifically for me. I, I, yeah, obviously, watching in silence was the first one I heard. I love it, but "Burden of Truth," "Middle of Nowhere," "Consequence of Power," "Delusions of Grandeur." Those records I go back to regularly for different reasons. They're just they're really good. Um, Thank you, man. As far as and we'll stick with circle to circle for a second. How did you end up? How did that come to be that band? Because I don't know the story, and I. I Love. I mean, I think you all have a very strong catalog, and it's a band that I can play for people, and they're like, "Wow, this is really good." And they end up listening to it. So, well, it came about because I had stepped out of Sabotage right. because of my young child Cassidy, who was about two, and you know, being a little tiny baby, and I just kind of said, "I'm going to take a little time." You got to kind of make the decision sometimes. I don't regret anything. I really like that I was there during the young. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Like, like, my youngest daughter came six years later, but things were, you know, evolving in different ways there. But everything was cool. I, What we did was, also at that time, Sabotage was inactive completely. I had gone out in like 2000, and it was like it was one more year. But then again, we had TSO, where 
Sabotage had kind of morphed into TSO, and now that whole transition was in full force around 2003 when we started Circle sure. to Circle. So John Oliva and Chris Caffrey and I said, hey, why don't we get another outlet where we can still write the rock songs while we know that this, this wild thing with TSO is taking off and it's sure. wildly out of control and who knows where that's going to go. Um, you know, how about we have another outlet to write music? So that's really how Circle to Circle came about. Those songs that are all on that first album was, you know, 50-50 writing between me and John. Awesome. And then Chris Caffrey had a couple of them that he maybe had one or two songs where we just wrote it, you know, like 50-50 or whatever. We just said, well, it'll be easy. Just to, let's go halves, everybody, and just see what we can come up with. So Awesome. That's basically how it came about. It was just another outlet. It really was really just supposed to be for albums. We never really envisioned it like a band going out and playing, you know, shows, but it, it did become that over the years. We had seven albums in 13 years and put a band together around it and crazy lineup changes and and stuff, but it was a lot of fun. And uh, the music, like you said, the music was strong enough for, you know, to carry us through some tours in Europe. And we even toured with John Oliva's Pain, Good another stuff. outlet for his music sure. because of all that. Uh in the States, I think it was 09 or something, we did like 15 shows and traveled around nice. and did it the hard way, take a van out there and just... <laughs> it's <laughs> it's right. I felt like we still could. I don't know if I could really do that kind of tour now, but um, but yeah, that, that's that's really how it came. Just another artistic outlet for the guys to ghostwrite sure. under another band name, um, just much, much like J.O.P. would have been. Or... It, you know, Dr. Butcher. Sure. Which was John and Chris's project. Right. It would just went under the, the catalog of one of the many uh, things like that. So, and then I, I want to ask you about Edge of Thorns and, and all that stuff, but just, just to, I really love the Wake of Magellan album. And I remember seeing you guys, and I, I was up visiting my mom which it was from Smyrna, Georgia. And I can't remember exactly. It was somewhere. It wasn't Atlanta, but it was somewhere in there where I went and saw you guys in like this hole-in-the-wall place on that tour. And I really like that record. That, that's a Sabotage record I go back to quite a bit. Um, and I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on Wake of Magellan. Well, I love it. I mean, it, it's got a concept within concepts. You know, originally, you know, you're talking about Magellan being the guy, you know, the explorer. Sure. And 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 painting the picture of, you know, the wakes or the waves that he left behind. You know, dwelling in the waves that he left behind is pretty much all of an entire, sure. you know, continent or peoples that come. You know, so it's astounding how one guy can bring, you know, a complete civilization, if you will. Oh yeah. And then you had. Then you had things in there like complaint in the system, which is another mini concept about this lady, Veronica Garrett, who was gunned down by the IRA in the middle of a giant intersection in Ireland back when the, you know, the, I, the Irish Republican Army was basically at a war against uh, Britain, England, sure. the Queen against, uh, you know, one of the people that's supposed to be in the UK. Right. In that long running war. So it kind of gets into that a little bit, which is, you know, gosh, completely different you know, part of history, um, which was very bloody and very bad until they called a truce. You know, right. could you imagine having a country that had like four parts or three of them and one entire one is just like, no. So that was just like a real struggle. Uh, and then, you know, stuff like Hourglass is kind of going back to a guy, a lonely guy on a beach after a. Uh, a wreck, a shipwreck. Right. It's all. It's kind of all over the place, but yet it's it, it's housed in one, you know, overall concept. But it still kind of goes all over the place. I don't think people realize how many different subjects are touched on. Even he, even and Paul. I say he, Paul O'Neill. Oh you know, yeah. Writing all the content or doing all the you know, the writing of the story, like he did with you know TSO and other sabotage albums, and going on and on and on. Right. A uh, genius. He, he even in that album has included allusions to 
the problem that they were having out in international waters with got with uh, people who were on the crew of certain ships from different places, maybe uh, North Korean ships or different sure. different countries, right? That were going out, and the crews that they brought out, they were simply just killing them and tossing them overboard out there right. on scoffer ships, just because. They just kind of did their work, and there was no use for them anymore. Sure. But then those things are hard to um, prosecute because you're in international waters, and there is no real, uh, you know, boundaries, um, you know, and you now you now you're outside of any of the, uh, you know, the limitations of the law. You know, there is no real law. You know, in international sure, it's waters. just you're right. It's, it's too complicated. It's too complicated to. So he even touched on stuff like that that I don't think people realize is within that album. It's um, it's a heavy. I mean, I remember when I first listened to it because all the sabotage stuff for me, you got to listen to the whole thing, you know, uh, take the yeah. take it all in. And I just think it's a really complete album. That's why I wanted to just talk to you about it for a sec because I, I yeah, just think it it's absolutely is. But again, it's taking inspiration from many different things. I think the song Wake of Magellan is the one we're talking about, hey, if somebody kills somebody in the in a, in a ship, you know, that they just don't have a use for them anymore, and they're in international waters, and they're outside of the jurisdiction of all international law. Right. What happens? Right, it's 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 pretty Leave cool. it up to Paul O'Neill to talk about that one. Yeah. He brings up all kind of stuff that makes you think. But, I, but the song Wake of Magellan does, you know, as he stood out on the watch deck, Looking out into the sea, you know, it would offer no solution, only silent company. Right. Like he's the only one alive that hadn't been killed yet. Yeah. It's chilling, really. I'm getting like, oh, I'm getting yeah. the willies over here talking about. Yeah, that's cool. But, but he would hand me the articles on stuff like that, and he said, this is what this is really about. So I'm kind of glad you asked, because I may be the only one who really knows what some of this stuff is about. I mean, it's... <laughs> I mean, if you're one of the ones who got handed the article, I just found it the other day. I stuff it away in imported documents, but I mean, it, it stacks up in these shelves. And sure. It's crazy. But great question. Um, to go back, because I, I don't know this story from other just pieces that I've read, would you mind uh, telling me how you ended up joining Sabotage? Yeah, I was out in Los Angeles going to a vocal school the first year all, uh, ever of Vocal Institute. BIT, which is uh, okay. attached to GIT. I remember GIT, you know, yeah. The whole school out there. Yeah. It was the first year they had it. It was a six month course, and that was good for me because I had been singing since I was nine and when it started with the drums. So, drums is my first instrument, So, but I had to start singing from day one because we didn't have a singer. So, I'm 10 years old in a three piece band. Well, you're going to sing then because we're going <laughs> to have time to go find a singer for the talent show. We did end up winning the talent show, and that's how I got the music bug in fifth grade. So then I went to see Kiss about two months later in 76 on a Destroyer tour, and that really got me, and, and, and now I've been there ever since. When you see that at 10 years old, it's <laughs> yeah, like sure. nothing could ever top that. So I'm like, wow. So I'm out there in L.A. putting the cap, you know, trying to you know get out from behind the drums, be a front man. So here comes Sabotage, which I was already a, a big fan of the band. Really loved Sabotage. They had just came out with Gutter Ballet. I was that, that was the only, I would say, cassette tape. And it was, back then we had cassette tapes. That was the only tape sure. in the player. Now, here they come playing Los Angeles. So I went out and checked that out. Actually got to meet them because I kind of saw some of the guys that said, hey, you know, they were super nice. And actually got to briefly meet up with Chris Oliva oh, and John yeah. say hey and uh and Steve Wackles on drums. So and Johnny Lee was there and kinda you know, so they really didn't even remember me too much, but it was just somebody just kinda saying, Hey Right. A regular fan. And uh, then we uh, I got word that they were looking for a vocalist around ninety one Okay. After the Streets tour, and it was kind of funny. I went to join a band, Wicked Witch, in Boston, where and that's where Jeff Plate came from. Who really? Was a long-time drummer for yeah for Sabotage and So I got Jeff into the into uh, Sabotage because when Steve Wackles left, they needed a quick you know somebody in there. We've had Andy James. We had oh. Andy James for a long time. If you remember, yeah, he played with us on you know the U.S. tours for Edge of Thorns. But 
for some reason that didn't work out. So then right after that, coming into the next album, they said, hey, let's get, who do you have? And I said, well, let's try Jeff. And he worked out great. He, everybody was impressed. So we had the band Wicked Witch in Boston. I left L.A., went to Boston, joined Wicked Witch. So we started playing shows up in the New England area. Right. Then in 91, I heard that Jeff, that John wanted to maybe take a step back, get off the road, get out of touring and, you know, do producing. And they were looking for somebody else to come in and sing. And I went, oh, so I sent the, the Wicked Witch demo. And really, Chris Oliva's wife, Dawn, is the one who really pushed it for me because cool. she found it. She goes, this is the one y'all need to do. This right here, he's different. He's not trying to sound like John, which was like, I understood that most of the demo tapes that came in, most of the people were trying to sound like John. And that was something that they it was like the, the number one thing, like, don't try to sound like John. Sure. So I knew that, well, this isn't sounding anything like John because... This is for a whole different band, and plus I don't sing like John anyway. Right. I sing sort of like John together. It's, a, it's an amazing force. Uh, it's almost like we used to joke and be like, you know, it's kind of like the, the, you got an angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other, and, uh, you know, that's what we do together. But I don't sing like John. No, John, just, John's, John's kind of raspy, kind of. Yeah. yeah. So I'm more clean. Yeah. And I got different facets, but mostly just completely different. So... That was the one that won out. They thankful, you know, and what a blessing for me, you know. I was like, I just got lucky, and mine kind of rose to the top of the heap. And then, you know, they said, and, and so Paul O'Neill, he was uh, in Queens, and he said, well, drive down from Boston to Queens, you know, sit in the living room, and I'll play some songs on the guitar, like Beatles songs or whatever, you know, Bad Company. Nice. Whatever it was, but I can't really remember all of them, but, and just sing through some of them. So those, I did that twice, and he was very happy with that. And he goes, I think you can work. I think that this will work. So now I want you to move now to Tampa. <laughs> you can stay in the hotel, at our hotel for a few weeks, but after that you got to find a roommate. Okay, fine. I was so so excited about it. it didn't, you know, nothing really mattered. But I ended up living with Chris Oliva for quite a while. Oh, cool. Because we just got along so well. I love Chris. And he was like, yeah, just come on and stay here till you find a place. So that went on like two or three months until I got another place. So I, you know, I, it was just a, a, an unbelievable experience. And what we did was write, I mean, they were writing in the, when we got to the rehearsal room, which was like ex- right away, like I basically got there the next day, we're already in rehearsal writing Edge of Thorns and, you know, getting all the songs together and just, it was, it was a warehouse. You know, not a real, like, small practice room sure. because you couldn't even fit Steve Blackwell's set in a <laughs> half of a, a basketball court. <laughs> so so that was the first thing. And I was like, all right, this is cool. We got a full PA pointing back at me when I'm singing so that they, you know, but everybody can hear it. I think everybody could. The drums, drums are extremely loud. But everything was, it was cranking. And I remember the, the minute that John... Was right was writing the opening riff for Edge of Thorns, da, na, 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 na. and he's going, "Man, is that Exorcist?" And I'm like, "It's close to Exorcist, but not <laughs> not near, you know, but not anything too close." Right. So he's like, "Okay," and Paul was like, "Yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. That'll be the, you know." And we just that they just pieced every. I mean, every it, it was piece by piece. We'd go back to Chris's house at night, and he would write guitar riffs that became much of the other songs, and you know, just having a really good time. You know, so you writing and getting up, doing it all over again. You got to and do the writing was, process with them then. Yeah, it That's, just God you know, damn that record I seriously is a really spectator. good. You know, I put in my little bits here or there, but you know, mainly the you know all that writing was intact with all of them having done it for all those years. You know, I just was basically like I do now. You know, <laughs> let's get everything together, send me the songs, and now hand me the lyric sheet, and then I'll do my magic after that. But it's like, it was so much fun. And then we got into the studio at Mara Sound, which we is now owned by TSO, which is funny. The, uh, Paul bought the studio. Oh, cool. We loved it so much. We did so many records there that he, now it's called Night Castle Studios, and it, um, it used to be called Mara Sound. Yeah. So the Morris brothers, Jim and Tom, they sold it to Paul. Uh, quite a few years ago, and then they got smaller, a smaller studio now, but uh, and semi retired. That's how long everybody's been in the that was 30 years, you know. Yeah, I believe that's 30 years ago. But no, let me see, that came out in 93. Which album are we 
celebrating the 30th anniversary of that people keep telling me. It's got to be Edge of Thorns. Maybe I think so. Yeah, it's Edge yeah, of Thorns. It is. Yep. It is. Okay. Ah, you see how I mean, I didn't even think about asking you about it. It's just a very, it's a very important record to me because it was my first Sabotage album. But I just, it is. It's the 30th anniversary of it. So that's one other thing about. One other thing I was going to ask you about that. Did you get to do a lot of shows with Chris before the his accident or whatever? I did, yeah, we did quite a few. We did like about, uh, oh God, we probably did 35 or so, uh, maybe 40 shows in the States. And then we had a, um, we did a full uh, European tour. Okay. Um, and maybe even a couple of them. So, I would say somewhere around a hundred, maybe somewhere around a hundred shows, maybe like that eighty to something like that. After two European tours and a and a U.S. run, and we were at the time that Chris passed away, we were actually it had just come through that we pretty much had signed on to do Vince Neil's solo band, go out with Vince Neil's solo band. We were just waiting on that. Right. That would have been really good for us in the states, but you know ah, that whole thing, you know. The whole tragedy hits. Oh, it's hor- and one of the greatest guitar players to ever live. And it's like, what, when that, and just to briefly touch on that, I know it's very weird to talk about it, it would be in the 30th anniversary of the album, but was that where it was such a whirlwind to end up joining Sabotage and then what happens to him? I bet you were probably devastated. I mean, obviously just as a human being, but just, shit, I just joined the band and now, you know, this horrible nightmare, you know. Yeah, that was devastating. I just remember, you know, getting the news and basically just going and just slumping down in a corner. I don't even remember, you know, for how long. You know, basically, we kind of thought the whole thing was, you know, that was it. It took a few months and we people started talking again and saying, you know, what would Chris say? But I, we all kind of really knew. He would be like, what are you doing? Get off your ass and do another right, album. Right, right. Don't be a wimp. Right. You know, don't, you know, because we know his personality. And, and, you know, eventually everybody came around. And that's why we went in to, to make Handful of Rain. Yep. Which was a lot different. But, um, you know, it, but yeah, definitely the hugest. Uh, I'll never forget. You know, it was just like it was yesterday. I mean, just like the hugest letdown and tragedy and piece of bad news that you ever could. Oh, God. I mean, I can't imagine. It's supposed to endure. For everybody. It was just like yeah. Really bad. Um, but, you know. That, you know, that's the way life is sometimes. You know, you hope to not get too many of that. No, um, no. But yeah, not, not want to endure anything like that. I no, God, no. Get to do anything like that ever again. But yeah, that record is very special to me. It was my first, and a lot of people's probably first sabotage record was something earlier. Mine was Edge of Thorns. So uh, yeah, thanks for, for sharing about that. It's it's it's, it's incredible. Um, with with Ark and Angel... Um, have you guys done any live shows with that, or is it strictly just been the studio material? Or we've done two live shows on a boat uh, on the ship, seventy thousand tons of metal uh, cool. festival. Nice. The ship that runs from Miami out to Mexico somewhere, yeah, yeah. And back, uh, the Cancun and back. That was in twenty twenty, though. And remember, we played one of the last two shows in, in the entire world. Oh shit! Minutes before it was shut down for the COVID pandemic. Right. So that was when the first record came out. Like a month before the whole world gets shut down and the music business goes, uh oh, let re- reconfigure this entire thing because now what do we do with the entire music business? And that's something that we all went through. Even TSO, they could not tour. We had to wait and go out in 2021. Paul O'Neill always said to me, and it was eerie because Paul O'Neill said to me, maybe even three or four months before he passed away, he said, you know, if anything were to happen, if we have to miss a year, you can only miss one year, young Zachary, because if we miss two, it's over. Oh, shit. And I'm like, where did that come from? So I shared that amongst everyone, and everybody's like, oh, my God. So, That's yeah, crazy. we had to really concentrate on make sure it's just one year. Sure. So we went out in 2021 risking everything just because of those mortal words. But it worked out that we, uh, we, we got by by the skin of our teeth without having the whole thing shut down due to too many people getting COVID. Because right. everybody was very careful. We had super strict rules even to this day. Right. So that helped. So we kind of had to come up with internal stuff. But strange the 
amount of stuff you hear, but you know, it is indeed. I don't know who had a premonition, probably Paul, but uh, it sounds like he was. Listen. But people should listen, and I'm always listening, I'm paying attention, and uh, it's just some of that stuff, it's just so strange. It is very, very strange. Well, this record's incredible. Um, kids, check out Ark and Angel's uh, second release uh, from Frontier Records, and it's coming out April 14th. Uh, and Zach, seriously, I appreciate you sharing all the memories. Uh, congratulations on the 30th on, on, on Edge of Thorns. Circle to Circle, always near and dear to my heart. The Ark and Angel stuff is great. Anything you do, so spectacular. And, and uh, I, I've been waiting years to talk with you since it's been 30 years since I, I've listened to the album. Wow. So there we go. And we'll have to talk again sometime. I totally enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I'll tell you, I will remind everybody. We got two videos out there to check out uh, from this new Archangel album that's out there right now. Look, uh, check out um, Fortress and one called Afterburn. Okay. Fortress I think and you Afterburn. Really like it. Fortress and Afterburn. Uh, and yeah, I you know and geez, let's talk again sometime, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thank you. And you know something? I sort of enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs>